What's up, my ballers? Welcome to the All Ball Podcast. My name is Nate J. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to rate us, review us, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support the show, our PayPal link is always in the link in this bio. Check it out. Any type of help is appreciated, much appreciated. And as for this show, I am sure you guys have all heard the CFL 2020 season has been canceled. Well, I got to give it to you guys real. I brought on two guys today that were on the inside, on both sides. Ryan King, a former teammate of mine at Edmonton, eight years, veteran, leader, 2018 Tom Pate Award winner, and he's third vice president on the CFLPA. So he has everything we need to know on the inside, as well as the top info man in the CFL, Justin Dunk. We got you covered, all sides. Everything you need to know about why we're not playing this year, what the CFL, the future holds for the CFL, and if we can recover. Also, I I, I asked if the players could get paid, because I really want to know that for myself. I need to know if the players are gonna get paid. I asked them all, we got you covered here. We go. Joining me now on the All Ball Podcast is two guys. When things happen in the CFL, if they don't know it, nobody does. I promise you that. Ryan King, a longtime CFL veteran, vice president, third vice president of CFL PA, leader on any team he's on, 2018 Tom Pate Award winner. He's joined by Justin Dunk. You ballers know him well. The CFL's top info man, breaking stories, Left, right, and center. This week, he broke a story to me about my kid's school that I had no idea about. So I believe anything he says. Thank you so much, fellas, for joining me. How you guys doing today? Dunk, how you doing, man? <laughs> Chilling, man. Good to be back on the out ball, baby. Let's get it. Uh, Kinger, long time, man. I haven't seen you since November. How you doing, my brother? I know, man. I miss you, bro. Uh, you know, really happy to obviously be on the show and... Uh, you know, I was real proud to see you take this initiative and, and get this podcast up and going. And I've uh, listened to all the episodes, man. You're doing a great job. So I'm happy to be here to support you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that so much. So as you guys know, big news came down Monday, officially announcing the CFL canceling the 2020 season. Uh, you guys knew a bit before that. I want to know from each of you when you first found out that it was going to happen and what your takeaway was. Uh, I'll start with you, Kinger. Where were you when you first found out that it was going down this path and what was kind of your mindset when you heard it was going to happen? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think first I'll just note I, uh, I most definitely knew it before uh, Donk did. I know when you uh, did your breaking tweet, and I knew it before that, just so you know. But anyways, uh, um, you know, it, it was tough, man. It, 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 you know, it's been four and a half months of, of working through this and, and, and a ton of ups and downs. And, you know, we, uh, I'm real proud of our, our bargaining committee, our executive board of all the, you know, work that we put into this. And, you know, to me personally, we were so close to, to, to actually pulling it off. And even to a point I was starting to get excited that uh, this was actually going to go down. And, um, you know, and then obviously, unfortunately, uh, with government funding and some other aspects, uh, we had to shut it down yesterday. So, you know, I was at my house, uh, I got up, we got the call, we, we, had our meeting, realized that uh, it's happening, and, and it was uh, it was a weird moment because I sat at my desk that I've been sitting for like four straight months working, and I was just staring at everything for like two hours until I started seeing it trickle down on on, on Twitter and whatnot. So it, it was a tough for sure. And I want to know before I get to dunk, how are these? You know, you mentioned you guys are doing a lot of work, a ton of work uh, with the PA and uh, along with the league. How are you guys doing these meetings? Were you, was it all over Zoom, online, social distancing? Like, how was that going down? I was I was always wondering that. Yeah, that's a good question. The, uh, it was definitely a, a different vibe. Usually we would meet in person. Um, we would do it over select weekends and whatnot. Both sides would meet. And uh, unfortunately, obviously, because of because uh, of COVID, we had to do everything over Zoom meetings. And I'd say at the, the peak of it, we were, uh, you know, five to 10 meetings a day. And even to a point, I had to kind of leave my, uh, my job I was working right now because this was uh, basically taking up the whole day. So, so, you know, I'm real proud of all the work that uh, the bargaining committee and the executive board put into this. And, you know, it's kind of a, it's a sad day to wrap it all up. But, uh, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty educated now in this whole online Zoom meeting life, as uh, I know you are as well, too, Tay. So, yeah, it was definitely different, but uh, we made it work. Awesome. And, Dunk, so where, 
where were you when you first found out? How did you find out? And, and what was kind of your mindset, your takeaway when you kind of saw it all go down? Because I've been talking to you a little bit and, you know, your, your optimism wasn't very high. You, you gave it a, a, about 15 percent chance in the beginning. But towards the, the, the end of last week, it was getting up there where you thought there was a chance where it could happen. Right. So what, what was your final takeaway when you, you found out how things were going on the, the, the way they were? It did seem like there was a sense that it was going to happen. And then on Sunday, when I broke the news about the federal government saying no to the loan that the CFL had asked for, for $30 million, I really got this sense, all right, it seems like it's just a matter of time until the season was canceled. So literally on Monday, I was at CHCH TV in Hamilton and I get a text on my phone and King of my friend is funny, but it's literally the internal memo sent from the CFL to the CFLPA saying they had just voted to cancel the season. So obviously when I get that news, I'm racing to fact check it multiple times, obviously, and then get it out as quick as I can. But it just left me stunned. And I can't even imagine what that would be like from a player's perspective. But you go along the process, and especially at the end, everything seems so positive. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be no Canadian football in our country to speak of, you know, even at the U sports level, for an entire year. It's just really surreal. Right. And Kinger, I'll go to you for this one. After the government says there is no funding, they deny the CFL's loan request. What was there a chance you thought there could be a CFL football without the government uh, funding? Yeah, uh, there's there's no question. I think, um, you know, obviously the storylines were heavily uh, focused on uh, the government funding aspect of it, which was a huge critical part of it. And the CFL obviously attempted uh, multiple times, but even more, um, more than I think all know, there was every angle to get funding um, being addressed as every op, like, you know, angle you could get at. So I think you're looking at partial funding. You're looking at, you know, all different kinds of loans. You're looking at, you know, um, all different types of loans. You're looking at uh, ownership group coming together and, and, and supplying this. If we get X amount of dollars from the government, who's going to pay for the rest? So funding from the government was a huge part of it, but those numbers and that working document on the financial side was much more detailed um, than just attached to the government funding. But that was kind of, uh, like Dunk said, that was um, kind of the final blow at the last moment that uh, I don't think anyone was predicting. Yeah, absolutely. And Doug, do you have anything to add to that or any other tidbits that we don't know about? Was there any uh, talk of a CFL season going on without government funding? The one part I'll add, and I don't think it's been put out there yet, is that there was a pretty serious conversation on Sunday amongst the owners about funding a season. And I talked to Bob Young directly, of course, the owner of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, or I should say the caretaker. And you could tell in his voice, he didn't come out and say it, but he wanted to play. So I married up what my sources had told me about the owners that wanted to play actually talking about offsetting some of the cost for the owners that didn't want to play to try to get it across the finish line. And I could really sense in Young's voice that he was one of those owners that wanted Wanted to go ahead with it. He wanted to see CFL football and he was le legitimately, and I know a lot of people are frustrated, but you could see it visibly when I was talking to him. So that's the most intriguing part to me is that the owners were actually talking about this and the ones that really wanted to play were really serious about it. They were not only going to take heavy losses for their own team, but they were going to fund losses where they wouldn't see much return, if any at all, on the money that they would put in for the other teams to play. Right. And to add to that, do you know specific? I know a lot of things came out on Twitter about which teams wanted to play and which teams didn't want to play. Could you add to that uh, from what you know, like which teams actually did and didn't? It's so tricky, you know, and King might be able to honestly answer that question better than me, but I know for sure Hamilton wanted to play. And it was yeah. pretty evident that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers wanted to play because Wade Miller was essentially behind the whole push to get the hub city in the Manitoba capital. So those teams, I think you can say for sure. And then what you're going to have to do is go through the other different various plans that could have gone forward in terms of who would have been in and who would have been out because I think it was fairly fluid. All right. Kinger, what, and now that we know the fate of the CFL for the 2020 season, what happens next? What, 
uh, is the future of the CFO looking like? Um, various reports, people on Twitter always want to talk that the CFO is going to fold. I don't think that's going to happen. But what is exactly from your point of view, because you are you are on the inside, you are uh, privy to these conversations. Uh, what, what What's next for the CFO in 2021? And could the 21-21 season be in jeopardy as well if, if we can have fans in the stands? Yeah, those are good questions there. And I wrote both those down. I'll get to those in one second. I think I want to just uh, just cap what uh, the last combo just about the teams I wanted to play, just to add something to that. Uh, every team wanted to play. Yeah, there's no question about that. Every ownership group wanted to play, every GM, every head coach. There's not a question all the players on every team wanted to play. If you want to get to the details behind uh, how to solve that, you have to just look at the business aspect and, and how the – each teams are owned. So if you have a community owned team versus a privately owned team, the availability to funding, the leverage to spend, um, the amount of people you have to answer to, to make those decisions uh, are much easier if it was a privately versus a community owned. So when you want to actually look at that, because yeah, I don't want to give the answer, but it's, it's, that's basically what it comes down to is that um, there's just too many different business models operating under the CFL that for, for that to happen, it would have been very difficult. So that was just how I went on a cap on that. And then uh, the future, um, you know, there's no question that the future of the CFL um, needs to get worked on immediately. Um, this can't be something that gets delayed uh, by any means. Um, the amount of work that was just put into this, this needs to be literally whiteboarded a race and, and start this back up again. Because in reality, we got eight months to rebuild an entire new, you know, CFL. and um, and, it, it, and it's fair to say an entire new CFL. We're going to have to address many aspects of the collective bargaining agreement all the way down to, you know, how teams are set up uh, to the financial plans. And, you know, we got to build a partnership with the CFL, you know, and, and all sorts of other things. So the work has to start now. Um, both sides are very positive towards the 2021 and the future of, and I think that um, the work that we did put in uh, regardless of, some of the negative uh, headlines out there, you know, there was a lot of accomplished during this. Um, and if we can take that, uh, call it motivation at the very end there, um, working together to, to pull this off uh, in, into the future, then, then I have no doubt that we will uh, have a very successful future in the CFL. Um, the no fans in the stands, there's no question. That's a huge issue. Uh, a main focus of conversation because the CFL is a gate, Gate, uh, driven, gate revenue driven lead, right? Um, right? The solutions to that though, they are out there. Um, science is evolving. You're seeing other models and other leagues uh, trying. So we're going to be able to get a lot of research uh, from that. Uh, the same kind of ways we did building the bubble. You know, we built the bubble off of protocols of all the leagues that were already started. So it was kind of fun to break all those down um, in prep of putting ours together. But, you know, we got to just stay current and uh, stay ahead of it. And then the fans in the stands issue won't be as uh, a big of an issue as it is right now. Absolutely. And uh, Duncan, what do you see as the future of the league uh, going forward? Um, do you think you can add to what Kinger was saying? It seems like they're going to look at costs all over and King probably knows a lot of this stuff better than I do, but I don't think it should be the players that they necessarily look to. I think that's naturally where the league might go because they've, rightly or wrongly been able to kind of strong arm the CFLPA in the past. And you look at the other revenue splits in the other major sports leagues, and it's closer to 50% going towards the players. The CFL is in and around 30. So I don't think the players are the issue at all, to be quite honest. And, you know, the PA guys might not come right out and say it, but you need to look at the commissioner and the board of governors and the higher ups and the presidents in terms of those guys being the top earners in the league, right? We're not looking at the people who are at the bottom end of the pay scale. We need to look at the top and yeah. trim on down. Essentially those people need to be the leaders. If you're going to talk about it, mm -hmm. just like anything else, you got to be about it. So I think that's what we're looking at overall is a restructure of the finances. But I don't think to be quite honest, that should involve the players. They just got to a point where the players, bumped up the minimum salary is 65000 something that made it sound a little better when the average person heard what a CFL player would make. So I think those salaries need to stay in line, and it's the CFL that needs to do a better job of bringing in revenue. Absolutely, and I'm with you on that because when you look up top, commissioner, uh, board of government members, 
like uh, team presidents, the, their salaries aren't capped, right? So, and we don't know what they're making exactly because their books are closed. So we definitely need to look there first, in my opinion. Um, moving on a little bit, what what do you guys feel uh, about guys? The, the paragraph 16 has been a big talking point, but there are a bunch of guys that are, are uh, under contract right now. What is the contract status of all the guys um, under contract, are guys going to be free agents? Uh, what about businesses that were due? What about guys that are American staying in Canada right now? Um, Kinger, what 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 do you think? Uh, we'll ask you about the contracts first. What, what what's going on with the contracts? Is everyone going to be free agents? Hey, so I just wrote the six points there, T. So let me know if I missed any. Um, yeah. So contracts as of now. So the, the okay, where do I want to go here? So. In the beginning, the issue we had is the language to delay the seasons and, 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 and around that. Because when you go into the contract language, um, uh, what they call it is, is important if it clauses our contract for Article 16 or not. If we become free agents, if the season's done, and vice versa. So it's important to note that with the language being the cancellation of season, now that actually puts us in a position that we can argue fully Article 16 and um, the status of the contract. So now this, what this does is this puts you in a position of mutual agreement that we don't want. And we don't believe that the members all want out of their contracts uh, collectively at one point, because then that would cause uh, its own issues. W- what needs to happen is there needs to be at least some sort of period of time where we do give the availability to members. If they do want to get out of their contracts and become free agents, that that is a, uh, a plausible option and and there's no question that that's being addressed right now and I see the outcome being very positive uh, for that and it will happen uh, very quickly as well too um, and and the the reason I know that is that there's there's other options um, for the players to stay in their contracts as well too and those will be coming out in the next couple of days here as well so there is going to be now a whole other plan that starts now that seasons actually physically word language cancelled and now we can start the, the other side of it. So, so that's the key part of the language um, side of the contract. So we all technically will, in the upcoming days here, have the option to um, address that and whatever way we want. And then basically the back end of that, that happens. Uh, all bonuses, anything that's in your contract now is, is effectively, you know, call it frozen um, until uh, – we basically put together uh, the new CBA moving forward for the 2021. Everyone's under their new contracts now until we amend a new one. So um, there'll be agreements that will have to be made during the process addressing all off-season bonuses, uh, which will happen uh, as well quickly. And what did I miss there? Uh, work visas. Work visas. Yeah, that's uh, another huge one. And we, you know, these are all things that we addressed well before even the decision. Um, I would say it's about a, a good week before um, the final decision was made. We, we started addressing all these and, and what the outcomes are going to be. And we're working with um, the government on that aspect to put options together. Now what's going to come with the work visas, not to get too much detail, but um, there's uh, going to be uh, uh, some support coming for the players uh, that standard contracts uh, that are going to be, tied to a government program and we're going to have to try to keep um, those players uh, attached to those contracts and working and active. So um, even with the canceled season, there's lots of um, ways to keep our our members employed uh, with the clubs. And that's going to be the key to keeping the working visas active. Uh, But as well to that point, there's also uh, agreements that can be made and amendments made that will uh, can keep our players uh, in those working visas, if it really comes down to it. So there's lots of angles to play there. Um, and there's no question that uh, we think it's uh, important that our players can stay in Canada, uh, even though there's a canceled season. Absolutely. That's huge, man. Uh, Dunk, what, what, what are your thoughts or, or anything you can add about the player contracts um, side of things? Well, I'm most curious about how it's going to work moving forward in terms of do the contracts stay put? And this is sort of a question for King, I guess. Yeah. Do the contracts stay put or are we going to have a fully amended 
collective bargaining agreement for 2021 because the current deal does actually go past next season. But what could that construct look like? And I think top of my mind right now is, are we going to have a time, maybe that'll be the schedule that we've had in the past where there's a free agency in February, but the players who had expiring contracts after the 2020 season, when might free agency take place? Is there any indication of that? Oh. Yeah, I, I think I understand the free agency question, and that's and and I understand what you're saying. Um, I would say that it's it wouldn't make sense to change those timelines uh, or those dates. Uh, I don't see a reason why you would. So um, I can see that staying status quo now. There's going to be movement, and there's going to be way more movement, uh, and there's going to be a period of time where players will um, have the ability to get out of their contracts of article 16 and, and uh, technically what we want to avoid is teams then just signing players. So we want to make it a true availability. If a player actually needs out of his contract to go make money to provide for his family in this current year, because we don't have a season, what we want to avoid is, is kind of what you're getting at is just a mass free agency um, while we're trying to rebuild and restructure 2021 moving forward. So I know the plan I could say, initially has been or the discussions have been around how do we make it more secure and more stable uh, for our members how do we make it so our members want to stay in Canada and build in the communities and stay way more involved in that aspect to stay more uh, engaged there to build their own brands to build the CFL brand all this stuff is being discussed in the initial stages of you know of of how it's going to look and you know we do have eight months to do this so we have time but just there's a lot of levels of conversation that need to start uh, before we start talking about an agreement uh, to the contracts moving forward. So basically how it works is yes, we are under a current CBA right now. Um, what will happen is those is any, any bonus that's due would be addressed immediately and, and, and contracts do uh, they be, they'll basically they won't be all renegotiated, but at some point there'll be uh, a process of where, it won't be like a free agency and that's where I know where you're going with that, but there'll be another period of time later down the road that there'll be a lot of movement as well, but I'm not going to call it a free agency level of, uh, of period. But um, once we p- implement the new CBA, then all um, uh, levels of that CBA will come in effect immediately. So we will be under the current CBA we are right now until that is ratified and signed and implemented. And, that will be under those terms moving forward, right? So you can kind of see where I'm going with like, there'll be our normal free agency period. And then, you know, once the new terms come in, whatever those terms are, will be implemented immediately moving forward. Um, And obviously those details will come uh, at a later date. So if free agency does stay the same, if I can just maybe get one more quick one. Oh yeah, go ahead. In February, let's say hypothetically, but then we're going to have a new CBA that's enacted, you know, closer to the season. If I'm a general manager or a team putting a salary cap together, wouldn't you want to have that in the reverse order to know what you can pay your players? Yeah, there's no question. And, and I can, and those are points that have been addressed. There's no question. And, and, and that's valid. Um, the, the problem with that is, is, you know, no one predicted a global pandemic to roll in and shut the CFL season mm-hmm. down for 2020. So, you know, things as well going forward will have to go in different ways as well too. Um, and, and there's going to be a, a, an unfortunate reality, you know, of certain aspects of the new current moving forward, but we, we have to address all of these. And these are all conversations that are no question have being had, but, you know, again, to your point, like, yeah, it does make sense to go the other way, but in reality, you know, we're going to have to uh, make – this is going to be different than normal, and, and that's also the motivation for the, the CFL and the CFLPA to be negotiating, you know, as soon as possible so that, you know, it would be hypothetically, you know, it would make sense to have it close to that free agent period anyways, right? So if, if it was – it could be timed up if done right, um, and we'll see how that all works out. But it's going to be an abnormal offseason with uh, – many changes that are going to be, um, you know, some of us are not going to expect coming and, and same with us. We have to work through an entire new agreement and that's going to be, uh, you know, difficult itself to do. 
Absolutely. And a guy like Nate Holly, when you're talking about contracts and getting out of contract um, to be able to find work, he's getting a lot of NFL interest. Do you think there's a way where he can pursue NFL opportunities when the CFL is not having a season this year? Yeah. And, and yesterday was a big day and that's why you just saw um, kind of that, that news line kind of resurface um, because of the language as I stated earlier, uh, of the announcement. So the language of being a canceled season now contract wise puts it in a different motion. So um, in reality, what's going to happen is, is, is we, our position on that is, is not only does Nate Hawley, but uh, many other players that, that want to have or take that opportunity to uh, get on an NFL roster or, or whatever it may be. We, we do believe that they all do have that right um, if that's available to them. And then on the reverse of that, we want to make sure we, comfortably uh, keep everyone on their contracts that want to stay and, and, and just, you know, basically uh, make sure we, uh, we take care of both angles uh, of this cancellation of season. Absolutely. And, and Dunk, are you hearing anything about the options that Nate has? Well, he has multiple teams interested. That was, I think going way back, even in December, right? He was trying to get out of the contract then. And his argument was, Hey, Trey Roberson on the same team, got released to go to work out for all the teams that he did. And why can't I get let out? Or Jonathan Kongbo was another one of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers that still had a year at least on his deal. And he got out to go sign with the San Francisco 49ers. So those were a couple examples that Holly was pointing to, but the stamps were trying to keep him. So the tug of war was happening and maybe finally Holly will actually get the opportunity. That's yeah, I know. I've been watching and I, I, I've been following along with all those other guys that got opportunities. And it, it, at the time, it didn't seem fair. I could see it from Calgary's point of view where, you know, you want to keep an asset like that. But, you know, when when other dudes in the league are getting released out of their contract, it almost seems unfair for you. Um, you literally in the same position to be denied an NFL opportunity. You know what I mean? So I'm glad it looks like it's heading in the right direction and uh, he'll finally get that opportunity. Um, uh, I want to move to this. What about the bubble? So like it, the, people were criticizing the bubble at first where they were saying that the tests weren't enough health, uh, the Manitoba um, health department wasn't going to approve it, but there were significant changes made to, you know, the bubble to make it safe. Um, I know at the, by the end, they were saying that it was going to be, you know, close to what the NHL had and they were comfortable approving it. What can you tell us of exactly what was going to go down in the bubble, how, how safe it was going to be? And, and if you felt it was actually going to be good CFL play, uh, football uh, to be had in that bubble, if the season was going to go along, Kinger? Yeah, that's a good one, Tan. I think that's first first time I've been kind of asked, and I think it's at least, you know, uh, a fun little kind of breakdown. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a kid, you know, when you're younger, you, you're building, you know, a big Lego or something like that. Like, in the end, like, the amount of hours, uh, hundreds of hours in meetings on the medical calls, the return to play protocols, both of those, all of those had to be combined and approved uh, by government, um, you know, uh, we were on, I was on all of those calls, all those committees and, and our role in the PA was basically to counter and, and challenge all, all of the, the protocols. So then it was to our adequate, you know, that we wanted as players. So, you know, basically I was just trying to break the bubble, you know, and find different ways to improve the bubble, um, find different ways to uh, improve the quality of life, you know, off of the NHL, the NBA uh, models. Uh, the NBA was the, the resort model. Um, the NHL was the, the true bubble. Um, so it was, it was cool to kind of go off of all the stuff you saw online, you know, you saw them playing ping pong. I'm looking in the background, seeing that they have like, you know, mats on the floor and like a Gatorade station and how they're doing it, where the sanitation, you know, it was, it got pretty deep, you know, to be honest. And, uh, by the end of it, we, we did actually mutually, and it took, took to the last, you know, very end for us to, to both get on board, but, but we did. And, and that was a huge accomplishment, uh, you know, for, for us. Uh, on the PA and the CFL um, and our medical team to, you know, get a document into federal government that's approved that, you know, we, we spent, you know, four months putting together um, and, and a lot of tough conversations regarding the things, like you said, the testing protocols and, and all that. And, and things changed very quickly uh, coming closer to the end of it. And that's just because that's when we had the most current info. So at times it was challenging to, not see changes in, in these documents, but at the end of the day, the, at the end, we, we did have to come together 
very much and and we agreed on you know really uh what i think would be a safe enough bubble to play um from a quality of life and mental health uh and just a quality of football you know we, we we pulled it together i think and that was also probably one of the hardest parts of seeing it shut down because we it was you know a day two days before we finally got it officially fine-tuned all the way to the appendix to the just so many things and then boom done so um it would have been it would have been doable we did it you know wade and the cfl side did a, a lot of work uh putting that together and same with our side as well and the doctors so um like i said it was kind of like a, a little kid's uh dream you know when you're building a huge lego but we got to build a an actual bubble concept that you know thousand plus people are going to be actually going in and playing so that yeah, kind of cool it's a shame that. that it didn't it didn't come together because I was reading a lot of the NBA stuff and you know pretty much you were doing what Chris Paul was doing for the NBA and trying to figure out what different guys needed and and quite like quality of life in there and having entertainment and you know because you're in there for a while but it's a, it's just a shame that it you know we can't actually see that to light. Um, well, I'll give you all here. Let me roll. Like, yeah, that's good. Let's get some mm-hmm. positives on that because like <laughs> you know we went from like a basic bubble, right? You got to think of it. It's like hey, hotel, boom, okay, security, shut it down. You get the framework, and then that's where we came in. And we're like, hey, well, we don't want to be on lockdown two four seven here. So right. by the end of it, we had we had uh, things as much as uh, restaurant rotations being booked out to uh, the idea of golf course concepts with shuttle buses and getting uh, a booking system, and almost like a, when you show up to a resort, you you get a, a weekly menu, mm-hmm. you know, and you can sign up online um, as far as. Uh, a mental health program implemented uh, with a, a very recognized uh, mental health doctor. And there was going to be a team assigned in there to each, each team. And there's going to be a lot of good work there. You know, we're going to get daily check-ins and stuff like that to keep everyone communicating. There was going to be like a family call center where if you didn't have iPads or phones, you could go and call your family and oh, man. stuff like that. Um, all the way to like uh, skip the dishes to, uh, uh, you know, Excel level, um, like Amazon, like, you know, shoppers, drug mart to the grocery stores. We had to make sure like rooms had fridges to microwaves, to blenders, to, uh, fridges, um, you know, all the way down to like the fine details of like, if you wanted different pillows to, to this and that, you were going to even have like an, an option to make movements, to get fans to, so we were trying to make it as like, as close to what I was thinking is like your normal day-to-day living. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a fun part of it. Like those are some exciting things that would have been attached to it, but, uh, um, yeah, it's too bad. It didn't all go down. Man, dude, I, I want to go to that bubble right now, man. <laughs> oh man. That sounds <laughs> dope. The coolest thing about the bubble, like they have these shiny NBA stuff and NHL, yeah. right? What would have been the coolest thing, Kinger? Oh man. Um, the coolest thing of the bubble, um, like the NBA had a barber shop, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> could play on BMO field and do all their <laughs> stuff. Like that stuff looked pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I don't even know if I want to answer that question because we had to, we had to fight pretty hard to get it to, uh, where we base baseline needed. Oh, it, you know? you got to let uh, us know, man. You, you, we took it this far. I guess. Well, the, the coolest part, like, you know, there, so there was going to be, so this is, this is a cool part. So there was a partnership, uh, that was, uh, that was made with a local, uh, a big local gym that each hotel was going to have like head to toe, like completely full gym. So you'd be able to walk wow. in and you'd have like five squat racks, dumbbells, and we got to tell them what we needed in it. And so basically we built all the gyms as well too, you know, and, uh, from like stereos to mirrors to team logos all over um like great cup you know you know you walk into great cup it's like yeah. there's logos all over the place we wanted that vibe so it was like different in the bubble you know um and then there was another room that was going to be for like virtual um you know we went, went as far as like virtual like a, a meditation room to, to yoga to spin classes you know all done virtually mm. so we were going to partner with you know local spins and yogas to run these sessions that guys could do and stuff so we got pretty deep um, into that and, and they appreciated all of our work in that aspect because, um, you know, a lot of times it, it made sense, you know, well, while we were putting this together, quality of life was a, was a big part of it. There's no question. Dude, that's, that's unbelievable. Moving to a question that we all kind of want to uh, answer to Justin, what do you think is the reason why the CFL was unable to secure the loan from the government? 
the loan programs that they had already set up and the terms in terms of paying that back were a four year plan and the interest rate would have gone about 7%. So that wasn't to the CFL's liking and to the best of my digging and King might know this better than me, the CFL wanted money interest free or they wanted a handout or a gift in kind was one way that Kevin Waugh, one of the MPs out of Saskatoon put it all along. And I think that's part of the reason that it got prolonged. I'm open to being corrected like that, certainly by King. But to me, that was the real issue is that there were programs already created. The league was already drawing off the cues program for some of its employees throughout the teams and at the league office. And that was going to be part of the COVID-19 CBA, let's call it, if a season happened too. So they were going to actually get some funds from the government. It just wasn't this lump sum of $30 million with no interest attached to it. You said the the league uh, asked the CFO for $30 million. And obviously, if the government had said yes, that every business in Canada uh, would, would be going to the CFO with their hands open, uh, asking for interest fee loans. Is that, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. They would have been going to the government and say, well, why can't we get interest free money? Yeah. My business is struggling in the pandemic. So that's why the loan amounts and the rates were there because you can't just be giving out free money as much as the government has done that in this pandemic. And I think also they will let wade the political climate of it a little bit. You look what happened with the Toronto Blue Jays and them not being allowed to play in Toronto, obviously a different situation there when you're getting into more of the health of it. But I also think giving $30 million interest free to a pro sports league might not have been so good for Justin Trudeau when he's dealing with the Wii scandal right now. Absolutely. And Kinger, I don't know if you can speak on this, but I got to ask you anyway, because you are on the All Ball podcast. Why did the government say no to us, man? Well, so Don relayed a bunch of, you know, I think valuable pieces to the puzzle. Um, but the one of it that most definitely is the key to all of this, you know, and kind of if you really want to dig into the financial, it, it, this is basically probably the easiest way to get to that solution is just player health and safety, the return to play protocol. Um, you know, we needed exemptions with the quarantine rule. Um, th there was multiple things that had to happen in, in, in the same aspect of the, of the Blue Jays. You know, the Blue Jays, we were, were declined to play. Right. So, so now we were going against the government as soon as that happened, that was real hard for us to take because we're putting together our return to play, hoping they get it so we can tail on that and, and get it as well. Right. Mm. Um, so they already shut down, you know, a pro sport league. So for them to even approve us is even, even harder to do right at that point. And so we had to get into such detail that it took all the way up till the last minute. And in reality, um, the medical, they're not going to give the funding before they know the, you know, the business plan, right? The bubble concept. Like we had to have that fully up to dated, approved. Um, and that was back and forth with the medical federal side. There was multiple calls, um, you know, suggestions that we, you know, we, we kept always advancing it to the very end and we just basically ran out of time. So I think the federal funding issue is why it's just the time crunch we we're in. You know, we're trying to get $30 million and that was the third crack at it. So, you know, <laughs> it's just uh, the reality is the time crunch and, and, and the, the late start to us negotiating uh, to pull this off. Absolutely. And you talk about a time crunch. Justin, is there a way where you saw this happening where if the league had done taking steps earlier in this process, because we did have a head start, um, the league didn't start till June. We knew about the pandemic in March. But is there a way you saw that uh, if the league had, you know, conducted itself that we would be playing football right now? There's one major one that smacks me in the face, and I think it will go down as the most memorable moment, uh, infamously, I should say, of the whole situation. And that's when Randy Ambrosi presented to the Standing Committee on Finance May 7th. I'll never forget about it. And there was no representation from the players there whatsoever. And also there was no plan of how the money was going to be divvied up, divvied up and what portion was going to be to the players. I think that really hindered everything. It showed the lack of 
uh, the CFL just wasn't prepared going into that. And the fact that they didn't get to the table with the players until, as you said, well into the process, I think put them behind from the get go. Like you said, we knew the pandemic was happening in March. And once they started to cancel the CFL combines and the national CFL combine, you know, they should have been thinking and getting the PA to the table and talking through it. I'm curious if King maybe can open it up and, under help us understand as to why that didn't happen right away but I think that was on the league and that moment really showed that you know the league didn't come prepared and it was something that everyone saw and made headlines everywhere and after that even though it wasn't maybe going to be the full number but that 150 million number got out there that it turned a lot of people off to it publicly and when you're looking at the political perspective and trying to take the temperature of the room I think that sort of sealed the fate of it because everyone's like no we're not going to give the CFL 150 million in actuality we all know it would have been less for 2020 absolutely um I have a couple questions follow-up questions with that so originally we had they asked for 150 million dollars and then it comes down to 30 million dollars I've been trying to figure out in my head what were we going to do with the 150 million dollars um because all we really needed was 30 when it came down to the nitty gritty. What was the $150 million in your opinion going to be used for it, Doug? The 150 was just essentially if everything, all of the worst fears came true over the next few years. So that was sort of the league projecting. All All right. In 2021, if you don't want fans in the stands, then that's kind of what it was going to be used for. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Kanger, the best leagues in the world have a partnership between their players union and the league office. We didn't see much of that early in this process, but can you tell us where the partnership is at now and and what you for, foresee it being in the, in the future? Well, I think that's a question that you can tie directly to, you know, what will the future look like in, in 2021 and, and moving forward? And there's going to be a substantial amount of changes uh, that are going to be needed in all aspects of, you know, CFL and operations. And, you know, the same is from a player's perspective to, um, you know, management's to, to every aspect of. So we're going to see um, the accountability come into play here because it's going to be noted, you know, and obvious the changes that, that will happen in 2021. So um, I think that all, all kind of sides are under pressure to really, you know, check their costs and figure out where you can make this more viable and sustainable for the future instead of, uh, you know, running it uh, year by year as it's been uh, for a long time. Right. And the players have been kind of, um, you know, put on the back burner for the most part. I know the PA has been working uh, their butts off for us, but you know, a lot of us, we feel like the league doesn't really care about us. Um, what what is going to be going on for the players uh, during this pandemic? You know, health, mental health support, financial support, um, any kind of things the PA is going to be doing for for the players? Because honestly, we right now we think you guys are the only ones that have our backs. Yeah, and that's probably fairly accurate. Um, but you know, so I'll, I'll do that in two parts. One. Um, so my, I'm eight years now on the PA and, and I remember my first CBA I've been through three of them, um, you know, just to see how our union was set up and how it operated and how it ran to, to how it is now. And, and like, that's something I'm unbelievably proud of. And even just to see the progress over the years, like, you know, even with the, the lack of communication during, during this, um, it was, uh, sorry, there's a cop behind me. <laughs> There we go. I'll pull me over, man. I had to go. Yeah, he <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, even during this, like during the, the, the negotiations when there was a lack of communication, we, we most definitely were were, were taking our, our, our foot on the gas pedal and, and we got all of our, our members on EI and CERB and, and we provided all the, the medical, the mental health and, and we, we launched a platform, LifeWorks, and we've had, you know, 250 plus, you know, access to it during COVID and we've had a, a ton of people reaching out to, to all the educational resources that we have that we launched during this time. So, so we definitely were in a reactionary position during this. Um, obviously, uh, some would have other opinions uh, of the CFL in that aspect, but, you know, we wanted to show that we were doing work. And, and we were trying to do everything we could and getting everyone on funding and, and making sure everyone had all the, the access um, uh, to those resources. Uh, and, and our union is as strong as it's ever been, you know, from our executive, uh, from Brian Ramsey, 
our executive director to to you know the members we operate so so much differently than we did you know even five years ago and and we're much more of a, a strong stabilized unified union and, and we most definitely uh, have the players back and in, in, in every aspect so um moving forward it, it's it's again kind of some at least to be able to, to, to unroll here uh, tomorrow. We have player rep calls um, and then a town hall meeting as well to book for tomorrow. And we're basically going to unroll steps moving forward. Now I can say uh, that it's going to be aspects related to our medical. You know, obviously the members want to know what's going to happen with our medical now that the season's canceled. Uh, a lot of our members are in America and they use our, our medical plan if they have kids or whatever the case is, accidents. Um, so that's an important aspect. Um, the government funding is another huge part of this. So so we'll be excited to, to kind of announce how, how that's going to be rolling out as well as going to be the Article 16 answer. So we'll be providing the, uh, the, uh, the answer to, to that as well too, uh, which will be, again, and the positive aspect and you know so I think this is the first steps of the league showing that they're willing to work together with us because they addressed um, basically all of our issues with a cancelled season and um, at least it's going to give not only certainty to our members that we have a final decision on a cancelled season but we're going to be able to give them right away and start um, you know the plans for moving forward so we can kind of just get all this behind us and start rebuilding for uh, 2021. That's awesome, man. Um, I know you can, you probably can answer this best, Kinger. And a lot of guys have hit me up and I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to ask Kinger. So I, I told, I told everyone I was having you on the show today and I was going to ask you, or is there any chance uh, the players will see anything monetarily this off season uh, be before we actually play another game? Is there any chance of that being talked about between you, the government and the league? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this was tied to if a season was starting or not. So there's even uh, an aspect of uh, a prorated uh, or not a prorated, uh, a back paid amount um, being being worked on right now and agreed on. Um, so those are those are numbers that I, I, I just don't want it for the for the fairness of what's going on and the positive outcome it's going to be. But um, yes, yeah, moving forward, uh, we're going to be trying to uh, um, keep our members uh, not fully funded by any means uh, attached to their contract, but there'll be uh, some, uh, some some funding support coming. Um, we're just working out the details. That's awesome. Um, Dunk, uh, can you, can you tell me a little bit about what the CFL has to do to repair its relationship um, with not only the PA, but the fans, because they've taken a hit throughout this whole um not just the pandemic, but the, you know, the asking the government for money, this whole process, they've taken a big hit in the court of public opinion. What do you think the CFL has to do to regain the, the, the fans that it has and, and strengthen its relationship with the PA? To me, it's simple. And I felt this way for a number of years. And I think it's all encompassing. This would be the players and the coaches and the general managers as well. Just be transparent. That's all everyone is asking for. Now, there are obviously some things that are not for public consumption, but I think overall the league needs to be more transparent. And when they get asked a question, answer it. For example, yesterday after the news broke, Randy Ambrosi is put on a phone conference call and he only does one video interview that's with TSN. I understand it. It's a rights holder. That's totally fine. But Bob Young is out here willing to do one-on-ones with people. And I was fortunate to have one with them. So a lot of people are saying, well, you know, why isn't Randy doing these things? Or why did the league not do a Zoom call conference availability that everyone is doing these days? So the transparency aspect to me is something that frustrates a lot of fans and maybe even potential fans because they can't get a straight answer when the nhl was going through their situation before they returned to play or major league baseball or the nba we all saw those commissioners front facing on camera answering the difficult questions and not providing non-answers or what i'm going to start referring to as ambrosia commission speak because you ask him a question and then he takes it in a totally different avenue that you're not even talking about so more direct more transparent i think would really help the cfl in the future 
Absolutely. And, and Tay, uh, yo, Tay, let me hop in there, man. I got to hop yeah. in. This is prime time, man. I need yeah. this for myself, for my sanity. I love it. This is what else we need to work on. The media out there, man. These guys, be you know, I'll tell you, it was following and knowing what was going on and seeing how this all went was – Interesting to say the least in the, in the aspect that it's important to have, you know, especially our, our inside reporters getting news out. But as you see, when it, when it spreads to the levels it does, right, it gets so skewed. And, and the amount of work that we would have to do internally to manage this was like just such a huge waste of time in theory of like just trying to, you know, have the aspect of just being patient and getting proper news out. Um, and then the other funny thing is, is we or I joke now of the – during COVID, we also lost the validity of breaking news. And then also now we see the uh, confirmed unnamed sources, you know, <laughs> all over the place. So it's always funny to see that. And uh, I was uh, thinking, you know, these top tens that are going on right now with teams, uh, it'd be almost a fun uh, fun thing to do to go back and get all the, the, the sports reporter tweets and then do my own top ten of the most, uh, you know, insider of, uh, of, of the COVID, you know. And, uh, and I got to give it to you, Don, buddy. You, you know, you're, you're, you're definitely way up there. So uh, your sources are fairly good uh, at times, but not always. <laughs> well, that's the thing I'll say. And, uh, you know, just for everyone in general, because I feel like there was a lot of blowback in terms of people saying – either you know you don't want football and that can be the furthest thing from the truth man like our website is based all on Canadian football I played Canadian football all the way through university love it I'd rather be watching games man talking about football not talking politics and federal government and finances and all this kind of stuff so the other part that I do want to get in real quick though is that what I do pride myself on is you know not putting anything out there that's informed speculation let's say so you know it it does kind of sort of feel nice when you say you know that I was on point but I try to do my damnedest and if I don't to be quite honest people wouldn't even imagine the amount of information that that doesn't get out there and I can only imagine from King or from your standpoint too that how much you know and then what you see and kind of what you chuckle at from day to day but I take great pride in making sure that anything I say or anything I write has facts behind it and is not just one sourced either. Yeah, that's a good response. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's it's one of those things where, like, when 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 you're playing the game, right, and and you know what the game plan is, and you know what uh, everything that's supposed to happen is, you know how guys are coached up to do stuff, and then you 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 know turn on TSN or whatever news channel. It's obviously TSN, and you watch the analysts who don't know what our schemes are, aren't in the meetings, criticizing guys, uh, you know what I mean, but without inside information. It's almost like that, you know, because we're on the inside. We kind of know exactly what's going on, but you have to kind of watch it from you know the outside looking in, get your facts together, cooperate it, and make sure it's all steady. But at times, it, you know, unless you're on the inside, you know, you're not going to have everything 100%. But, you know, it's, it's that's the kind of um, – you know, example I always think about and, you know, when I see stuff, I always, you know, hesitate and make sure it's, you know, I double check it and check it with people inside. So, you know, I feel, I feel for you, Doug, man. I, I, you got my trust, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I, and Tay, I'll, I'll, on that, I'll say it was, it was fun too. And this was all very new to me, even being on the executive and being on this table, um, you know, this was this was all a huge learning experience, and I'm very grateful for that. And, uh, but it, it was cool to see a consistent about four day delay. So even you know when it first got leaked, however, it was about a four day span. So sometimes when we were in the heat of things, something else would finally hit that four day window and come out, and, and we would be confused. You know, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's 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 old news now. You know, for us, kind of. You know. Um, so it was kind of fun because we had to do a lot of like damage control and old news to us, you know, but that was definitely uh, stuff that was coming like quickly down the chain. Right. So it was fun to be at the table and kind of just watch as well. Kind of like who we you could figure out like who this, who not like who, who sources or who's kind of, because we would, we would not, we would not Did get you stuff out those down. Sure. Dude, I'm telling you, man, we got a good breakdown. We know, we know who's on what side, man. You know? Hey, Kinger, do you ever ever plant like uh, like fake stories just to to see who's giving out? Day tip? off record, bro. Day, I'm not going there with you. We will have that one on one. Not even with <laughs> stuff, bro. I'm telling you, it's all right. Man, I've already awesome. been sold that before. It's cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's amazing, man. This is, this is, man, that's more interesting than, uh, you know, real politics. Like, how's the cards, man? <laughs> <laughs> but fellas, crazy. Renew, and uh, Kinger, I want to ask you um, if there's anything else you want to, you know, tell us about the, the PA, the process, um, j- just before we get out of here that, you know, the fans don't know or, you know, that can help us deal with, you know, not having football in, in 2020. Well, I think I definitely, you know, I think we, we, this is the first time I, it's been great for me to kind of be able to just break this all down and, and be able to talk about it all because there's a lot of positive aspects of this. And the reality is, is, you know, we're living in the middle of a global pandemic and, and, you know, one that's very deadly across the border. And, and I have a much more understanding of why, like we tried our best. There's no question. Um, there's no way that I would leave this thinking we didn't put every effort possible into pulling this off. And the reality is it is that this most likely was the right thing to do. Um, and, and now we have to just, you know, tell people and, and, and get it out there. What, what all the work we did so people can see. Um, and, and from a fan perspective, you know, we're going to come back even stronger because this is now an opportunity for us to rebuild from, from the inside out. And, you know, the, uh, the inside of the CFL has been pretty, pretty uh, stonewalled for, for a long time. And, and they've stayed true to the way they've, they've done things historically. And um, now with, with the outcome of, of a canceled season, we'd have an opportunity to, you know, truly get a partnership together. And, and we're very motivated to, to be available to that and uh, to, to really come back and, and be so engaged in the community and just come back in such a positive aspect that, you know, the stand, stands and the stadiums are filled again and, and uh, the CFL is thriving um, way, way, way past uh, COVID uh, pandemic. That's awesome, man. And I'm, you know, to hear you say those words, it's, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, I know firsthand that you guys put in a ton of work, man. And it's, uh, you know, hats off to you and, and the whole squad, you know, for looking out for us. Um, uh, always, always, man. And you, you know, Kanger, man, I, I think so highly of you. You've been a leader since the first day I met you. So I appreciate you taking the time uh, you know, to be on the podcast, giving us the straight news from the inside. Uh, Dunk, is there anything else you can add? I know we, you know, CFL football is canceled for the year, but what what can fans, you know, kind of, you know, the bank on you know, going forward and uh, kind of feel good about CFL, maybe if there is anything? Well, to be honest, I think it's guys like Kinger, right, that I think unfairly as the process was going along, a lot of people thought that, you know, Randy Ambrosi had his feet up on his desk and there was nothing going on. But meanwhile, as you know, well, today and, you know, Kinger wouldn't say it because he's a modest dude, but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, even when people literally thought, you know, there's nothing and these de- supposed, you know, these self-imposed deadlines are going by. So I think what I take away from it is there's a lot of people who love this league that are working very hard to make sure that it comes back bigger and better in 2021. And that's something that I'll just sit back and listen and and learn about and can't wait to see some ball. Awesome, man. Fellas, thank you so much. This was so fun, man. I think, I think when CFL football comes back, we got to make this a mainstay because I learned so much on both sides and having both of you guys on was, was a blast. So thank you so much for joining me here on the All Ball Podcast. We definitely have to do it again. And you guys stay safe and be well. Thank you, guys. Bet, man. Have Later, a good one, man. Good chat. There you have it, what we all were searching for, some clarity. A huge thank you to Ryan King and Justin Dunn for jumping on today and giving us answers to all our burning questions. I always say if these two guys don't know something about the CFL, nobody does. Last but not least, thank you all to all you ballers for tuning in. Again, don't forget to follow us at the All Ball Podcast on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter for great content. The one and only Scotty Mac keeps it coming. Until next Sunday, peace.